you ever have everything you need except for that one last part, the one thing you just don't have, you have to have, you can't do it without it, can't get started without it, you're just missing that one thing, didn't see it coming? Right? That's what happens to the Maccabee family. They're sitting there, we read this in the, uh, the story of, of Hanukkah, if you haven't guessed, the story out of the Maccabees is the story of Hanukkah. And uh, they're standing in the middle of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 165, and they're standing there thinking, man, we need some oil. We really need some oil. And uh, the reason they need oil is they have come to the completion of this two-year campaign to reclaim Jerusalem. Uh, the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes IV, a great name, uh, had been ruling over Jerusalem, over Israel, and he had dared to uh, put a statue of Zeus in the temple, a sacrilege, and he had defaced the temple, and he had made illegal to be Jewish, basically. He had uh, made it illegal to do any of the Jewish practices that made a Jewish person Jewish. And so the Maccabee family had led this revolt over two years to evict Antiochus Epiphanes and to uh, bring the Jewish people back into control of their nation. And here it is. It is the anniversary of when it had all begun and they are in the temple and it's all come together. You know, what's the old phrase from the A-team? I love it when a plan comes together. I mean, it's that moment. Everything has come together. They're ready and they don't have oil, right? But they are ready to start worship again, to the capstone of bringing the Jewish people back as a nation. And they have it cleaned up, and they've brought in some good priests, and they have it all ready to go. They put the doors back on the frames. The one thing they don't have is oil. Right there, they, to on the altar at the at this uh, the temple was this lamp that never went out, never. It, it, it never went out, and the only oil you could burn there was the finest and purest olive oil, and they didn't have any. They scrounged all over the temple and they found one single small container marked with the seal of the one of the last high priests, and, and that one small container. Uh, it was enough oil for one day. And so they went ahead and did it. They lit the oil lamp, enough oil for one day. They rededicated the temple. Their campaign has come to completion. And then some of those Jewish priests ran off and scurried as fast as they could scurry start making some olive oil. And so they're gathering olives that first day and picking olives and getting, making sure they're clean, getting all the twigs off, all that. And that, that's the first day they're not worried. They have enough oil for one day. Of course they'll be fine that one day. But the second day, uh, they start crushing the, the olives. And, and it would be nice if you could just crush an olive and oil would come out. There's a lot of other stuff that comes out too. Uh, there's water, there's gunk, there's goose. I read all about it. The long and short of it is that you squeeze an olive you don't have olive oil, you have a lot of goo. You still have to separate it all. And so the second day, they're, they're starting to crush the olives, and uh, they're getting nervous, but the lamp stays lit. The third day, as they're continuing through this process, the lamp stays lit. They're getting more and more nervous. How long can this lamp stay lit? The fourth day, the fifth day, at, uh, eventually, at some point along the way, they had to have uh, realized that there was something happening here and that the lamp wasn't going to go out on them and, and that they weren't going to have to go back to, to square one and rededicate the te temple all over again. And on the eighth day, when the olive oil was made, the purest and finest olive oil that could be made, they, they brought it to the lamp and they poured it in and, and they marked that moment. They, they said this oil has lasted eight days and, and we will now celebrate the oil lasting eight days. And so to this day in the Jewish calendar, the Jewish uh, festival of Hanukkah, the, you light uh, an eight branched uh, candelabra with eight candles, one for each of the days that the oil lasted. And then there's a ninth candle that's above the rest and that's the, used, the one used to light all the others. But uh, the eight candles uh, of the, on the same level, um, that, those mark the eight days that the oil lasted. Right? And so here the story goes that for all of the might of the Maccabees, for all of their military prowess, for everything they had done, in the end, they were dependent on how fast the Jewish priests could make olive oil. Right? Uh, their entire campaign ended up being dependent upon making some olive oil to, to, so that they could continue to, to burn the, the lamp in the temple. And because they were dependent, they waited. And God blessed that waiting, and the oil lasted. 
Almost 200 years later, Mary, one of the Jews uh, who was then under the control of the Ro Roman occupation, also yearned for someone like the Maccabees to come forward to, to bring her nation, her people, freedom. And she was told that she would bear the, the son of David, who would sit on the throne of David, the Prince of Peace. He would be the anointed one, and you anointed with olive oil, the purest, finest oil, that same oil that we talked about a minute ago. Right? And so after waiting nine months, she has this this child, this child upon whom all people will depend, and uh, the child that will sit on the throne of David. But first, he has, they have to wait for the child to be able to pull up, because you can't sit on the throne of David until you can stand up and at least pull up on the throne of David. Right? The, this man who we will all follow in his footsteps, including Mary, right? we can't follow in the footsteps of Jesus till he learns to put one foot in front of another. Right? You're going to have to wait. The one who Mary is dependent upon, she is going to have to wait. And, and I have this great mental image of her uh, teaching. We, we read it over the years that Jesus grew in grace and wisdom that uh, so that he had to learn, right? And, and when you learn, you mess things up. And, and I just have this mental image of Mary looking at Jesus who has knocked the chair over for the seventh time as he's trying to walk going, Jesus! Ah! And it's not sacrilege. She's just saying, Jesus, yelling at frustrated mom because who doesn't get frustrated at their children sometimes? That's a, so got to wait, right? She was dependent upon him. Any, something is going to happen. It's going to be amazing, but she has to wait. And she has to wait 30 years, right? It's a long run. have to wait 30 years. The Maccabee family and, and Mary, they, they show us waiting, right? For all that they have done, they are dependent on what God will do, and thus they will have to wait. We, too, are dependent in the same way that they are. We are dependent on a specific Messiah born at a specific time, in a specific place, who tells us to walk in a specific way. Right? We are dependent upon Jesus, who says he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is, that is our gospel, right? Depend upon Jesus. If you depend upon Jesus, it will work out. Right? Be dependent upon Jesus. That's the good news. Depend on Jesus. What do we say as a culture, though? Right? What, do we glorify being dependent? Isn't he a great guy? He's dependent? No, we, we glorify independence. Right? We are a culture that glorifies being independent. The self-made person, the self-made man, the self-made woman. We want to grow up, move out, build, build our own house, and be independent. Every once, I mean, that's just how what, what we glorify, right? Every once in a while, I get a glimpse of how much we bake into our culture the, the glorification, the, the value of being independent. I was talking to a woman in Kirksville who wanted her in-laws to be able to move in with them as they got up in years, and she told me of her struggles to find a house that they could do that with. Who here thinks you could find anything other than a one-family house built in the last 30 to 40 years? They don't exist, do they? So she had to build her own house so that she could have her in-laws be able to move in with her, and they kind of built a suite along the back to, that was accessible for wheelchairs and all that. But we, we, we just build, we, we don't even question. We are independent. That's how we live. Right? And those who are obviously dependent are, are pitied. If you are elderly or disabled, or you have to uh, help, get help to provide for your, from your family, government assistance or something like that, th that is something uh, that is to be pitied. We, we, nah, that's a shame. We, we wish we they would get better. They would, wouldn't be so dependent. They would be independent. Right? And so we avoid, we avoid being dependent at all costs. We will help anyone who asks, but you know, we, we never ask for help. It seems Midwestern. We, mm, I don't ask for help. I'll just do it myself. Right? How often have you heard yourself say that? I, I'm not going to ask for help. I'll just, yeah. We, we, we want to be independent. Yet we are not as independent as we would like to think we are. I would argue that just as the Maccabees were, just as Mary was, we are, independent. we are dependent on each other. I'm dependent upon you, right? With y'all, when I walk into Milan, what am I? I'm a servant and a leader in the community, right? When I walk into the store, when I meet someone with you, I am a servant, I have purpose. If y'all didn't exist, right, what am I? Just a dude who knows a bit about the Bible, right? I am utterly dependent upon you for what I'm going to do when I get up in the morning. My purpose, my, 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 what I do, who I am is wrapped up in that I am dependent upon you. And, and I'm not alone in that. Right? You are dependent on each other. 
Imagine what your day would be like tomorrow if everyone else in this room went poof. What would you do? Right? Our lives are utterly dependent upon each other. We can talk about independent all we want, but it's, it's not true. Right? To accept and to name how dependent we are upon each other. I think that's part of what Jesus is getting at when he talks about receiving the kingdom of God like a child. Right? How do children accept things? Right? You, you, a child is a child not a child will ask for help in a heartbeat. I mean, Fletcher comes around the corner, ma, ma, he, he, he needs help. But Fletcher is a little, uh, Sophia is a little bit more refined. She uses her words, help me, and she even says thank you on occasion, which is a beautiful thing. But children, they, they have no qualms about the fact that they are dependent. Right? They ask, and, and there's no like, oh, I don't need help. They receive. And they say thank you, if, if you train them, which is a good thing. You know, once we are willing to admit how dependent we are, and I hope everyone can do so, we can grapple with a particular aspect of being dependent that becomes important for this time of year. If we are dependent upon others, you know what happens when you're dependent? You end up waiting, don't you? Right? If you are dependent upon anyone else in any capacity, you're going to have to wait. How quickly can you get out the door if you're just going by yourself? I can be out the door and having coffee at 6 a.m. if I'm going by myself. Right? How quickly can I get out the door if I'm going with people? People that I depend upon, people that depend upon me. What do you think is the quickest I could get out the door with Olivia, Sophia, and Fletcher? Yep. You want to chime in? How, how, what's the earliest we can get out the door? Well, I'd give it a good hour and a half. Yep, All right. As soon as you are dependent upon someone, you're going to wait. Right? It's just how it's going to be. To be dependent upon others means you're going to wait. Because everyone has their own way of doing things. Everything, everyone has their things that they need to do, and, and you're just going to wait. The Maccabees want to get moving with the rededication of the temple. They want to get it taken care of on this day, on this time. And you know what? They're going to have to wait because they got to get the olive oil figured out, right? Why? Because God has said, this is the oil you're going to use. You can't run down to the quick trip and just grab a bottle or whatever. This is what you use, right? You're going to wait because God has a certain way of doing things, and you're dependent upon God, so, well, welcome to waiting, right? In the same way, Mary, can you imagine the discussions that Mary wanted to have with Jesus? Like, I mean, he, so Jesus hits his bar mitzvah. He's an adult now. What, what, 13, you're an adult as a he, a Jewish male child, 13, 14 years old, and Mary's sitting down with Jesus. So, you're going to get started on that whole Messiah thing, Jesus? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. How many times do you think she sat down and had that conversation? Jesus turns 20. You move it out? Right. Right. Jesus turns 25. You know, those are some great looking tables. I think you got this, the whole carpentry thing down, Jesus. Could you like save the work. I mean, at a certain point, she, what, is, what happens? She's waiting because it's going to happen on his time, not on hers. She's dependent upon him. She is going to wait. Right? Think about how you wait. Right? Think about when your family has to make a decision, how long does it take for your family to make a decision? Takes a bit, doesn't it? Right? How long? How much do you wait for people in your job uh, to do their part, or even in your church? Because Lord knows we don't turn on a turn on a dime. People ask me if a church can do something, and I tell them I got to have a Sunday. I can't do anything in the church without a Sunday. It's just I got. You have to wait. I depend upon you, and, and that's just how it works. Right? The thing that happens is while we wait. God uses that waiting. Right? God blesses the waiting. When the Maccabees are waiting for those eight days for the oil to be made, you know what they got, how God blesses that? The oil continues to burn, and the Maccabees learn something. You know, you had all the military might, I'm the one who rededicated the temple. They, they learn who's really in charge at that moment. They learn to trust and to wait upon God's time. All right, Mary was waiting upon Jesus, and, and yes, she had to wait 30 years. But she had 30 years with a son, a blessed thing. Right? Think about what you have waited upon. What's the longest you've waited for something? I'd be interested in knowing. What's the longest you've waited? Don't even tell me what. Just what's the longest you've waited for something? You all get immediate satisfaction every day? What do you, what's the longest you've waited for something? Nine months. Nine months. 
I wonder why. why? Uh, <laughs> what else? What, what's, the, what's the longest you've waited on something? I think I'm still waiting. Still waiting. How long have you been waiting? All my life. Yep. Nine months, an entire life. I, I, I waited uh, many years. I thought I was going to be ordained about three to four years before I was. And I've told you about this before. But it continues to be one of the most important things of my life that it took me that many more years to be ordained. Because I was waiting on people. They, they'd interview you, but they only got together once a year. So if it didn't work out, guess what? You're waiting. And I'm dependent upon their decision. So i got to wait a whole other year. Yeah. Right? No one likes waiting. In retrospect, I can see that waiting as one of the most important... I learned something that, that I wouldn't trade for anything. I wouldn't inflict this on anyone. But I wouldn't trade for any, anything that what I came out of those years, three years knowing. That it doesn't matter what someone in Columbia says, that I'm a pastor based upon what happens today and right here. I am dependent upon you. Right? I am profoundly dependent upon you. I'm not dependent upon them. It's nice. It's convenient. It makes sure I have a retirement program, which I appreciate. But I depend on you. And it took three years of being told no, 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 no for me to learn that. And that's a blessing. Right? When you're waiting, there can be amazing and blessed things that are happening. Right? Understanding deepens, relationship grows, God blesses the waiting. Right? And I think it's a shame that we're in the middle of this season, we're rushing towards Christmas, we're going to hit Christmas, and, and then the Sunday at, we're going to ha have Epiphany, the wise men show up, baptism of Jesus, hit January, and February 10th is Lent, right? We are, within a, we are about a month out from the beginning of, of Lent, and we're, I mean, we're going to go from Jesus is born to putting Jesus on the cross in a matter of weeks. Uh, and how long did, did Mary wait for that same span, right? Jesus is born to Mary on the cross, it took 30 years. It takes a while. And that waiting, I, I think it was a rushing... I mean, it's just how the calendar works, but we miss something, right? I think that charged Jerusalem, we miss something that, that the disciples had to figure out the hard way. But when Jesus says, follow me to the disciples, and they start to get the sense of what he's doing, imagine those conversations when, uh, okay, the disciples have been following Jesus for a year. Do you think they sat down with him and said, so Jesus, you going to Jerusalem yet? You know, we've been at this for a year. Are, are you ready? No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Let's go walk that way for another year. And so they walk that way for another year. And they go teach some people and do some miracles. And they hear some more parables. And they sit down and, hey, Jesus, it's been two years. You think it's time to go to Jerusalem yet? Nope, nope, nope. Let's go that way for a year. And they go that way for a year. And they come back. And after three years of following Jesus, the disciples, who they, they know what he's up to, they sit down. Hey, are you ready to go? Okay. Three years, that, that'll work. Right? Waiting three years. Right? If you were the disciples, just let's, let's acknowledge, for all that the disciples catch flack for being dunces, for not getting it, for not understanding what is so obvious to us, um, they were patient. Right? They were remarkably patient. Can you imagine following someone for three years, day after day? Right? But what happens in those three years? The, the, the disciples, they're 15, 16 or so when they start following Jesus. What happens when you take a 16-year-old and you train him or her for three years? They come out as 20-year-olds, trained and ready to do something, don't they? And that's what happens. That time following Jesus was blessed. Those 12 disciples come out ready to build the church and change the world. And that's what they did. Right? At Christmas... We don't celebrate the giving of more commandments or another book of the prophets. What we celebrate is the gathering around the giving of a child, a member of the family, someone upon whom we are utterly dependent and thus who we will wait for. Right? And this waiting with Jesus and for Jesus is important. God blesses the waiting and that their relationships develop that transform us. It took three years of the disciples following Jesus to, for them to turn into the men they needed to be to change the world. Right? It took a while. The waiting matters. Right? So let me ask two questions of you, two, two ideas for, for you to take home. Are you waiting on someone? Are you waiting on something? Right? If you're waiting on something, whether it's been a few months or whether it's been all your life, I'm going to invite you to see that waiting not as a problem, but maybe as part of the process. 
Maybe it's important. Maybe there's something to learn there. Maybe God is going to take that waiting and use it. Maybe you're going to know something at the other end of it that you did not know today. That's the first one. The second one, I, I want to observe that family gatherings are about to begin if they have not started already. People are going to gather that we are profoundly dependent upon, our friends and our family, and we're going to get together, and we're used to going a certain speed, and then we're all going to get in the same room, and it's going to be like herding cats, and we're going to all be off like a herd of turtles. Right? That's how it works. You get all the family together. Let me suggest that the waiting doesn't get in the way of Christmas. The waiting is an essential part of Christmas. You're going to get to get with your family and it's going to take a while to do anything. Welcome to Christmas. You're going to wait a bit. God will bless it. Amen.